As Alberta approaches its 100th birthday, its past is recognized as a necessary ingredient of understanding its present and preparing it for its future. The Lac St. Anne Historical Society's Museum, situated in Rochford Bridge, fulfills this role admirably. Here you can feel and appreciate the lives of our forebears by the thousands of little commonplace items that were an integral part of their existence. Come with us on a virtual tour of this friendly archive of discoveries and memories. The grounds consist of four buildings, a pioneer cabin, a blacksmith shop, a schoolroom, and the main building itself. Let's begin there. I am uh, Marion Dinwoody. I have lived in the district for nearly 40 years, and I personally knew a lot of these old-timers that started this museum. They built it without any help from the government. They did it on their own. And the plaque has their names on. Mrs. May Walker and her sister, Mrs. McPherson, uh, took time to write a book on the history of Lac St. Anne, west of the fifth. And through the sales of that book, they were able to raise a lot of money for, for the museum. Okay, hello. Uh, this is uh, a movie I'm making, I guess, uh, for the uh, Laxing and uh, Historical Society. I'll get you started. Okay, uh, if we look up here at the, uh, the map up on the wall, it's the uh, county or the municipal district of Laxing and uh, We have uh, the Pioneer Museum is uh, shown by San Guro, which is obviously not true uh, today. Uh, it's been in uh, Rochford here for uh, a while. Uh, it's been uh, in here since 1992 uh, and uh, since it's been here we've had uh, the addition in the back. But if we look uh, over here we have uh, in 1821, that's the first verified report we have of hunters, fishers and trappers and so forth coming to the Lac St. Anne area. Granted it was the first verified report so people probably did come a little bit earlier. Uh, up in 1845 we have a minister named Father Thibault. Uh, he set up a mission uh, in the town of Laxinan uh, by Alberta Beach where you see the pilgrimages and so forth set up today. Uh, in 1859, that's when you have uh, three nuns came to Father Thibault's mission. They came there primarily to teach and to nurse. In 1862, that's when the Hudson's Bay Company was established in the Laxinan area. It was set up in the town of Gunn Incidentally, the town of Gunn was named after the, uh, the shopkeeper of the Hudson's Bay Company in the Laxinan area, a Mr. Peter Gunn. Uh, in 1904, that's when you started to see a major boom in uh, settlement, uh, as with pioneers and so forth uh, coming here and creating farms and starting families and so forth. And in 1959, that's when we uh, have the creation of this building here that we're in uh, as a Pioneer Museum. It all started in 1957 with uh, the creation of uh, the Historical Society. It all started when a bunch of local people decided to get together and try to preserve the past. And they finally got enough funds and donations and so forth to create the building in 1959. Now if we look over here, we have founders on the plaque and the wall, as I was saying. And then we come back over here. Uh, we have this uh, portrait here, uh, quite nice. It was inspired by this photo. It's of the Crockett family, one of the uh, instrumental uh, pioneering families in the Laxinan area, but more specifically in the Merthorpe and Rochford area in which we're in now. Uh, kind of neat. It's in the back there. It's covered up by canvas. You can't see it, but it's actually this stove. And the only reason why we can verify that is because uh, Mr. Leo Crockett Sr., the man riding here, 
was on our board of founders in 1957. Uh, kind of neat to hear uh, some other just cooking utensils as you see the iron kettle. Lots of things made of iron back then. Uh, very sturdy. We have a handmade pancake turner here as it says, but I'm sure they used it to cook uh, many things. Uh, and we have uh, this not so old, uh, it's an old Stover waffle maker, but uh, kind of neat. And then we come over this way, we have our our lamps uh, collection here. We have a railroad platform lamp uh, used in a local station of Cherry Hill until 1960. And up here we have uh, a sleigh lamp. Uh, most of our lamps have to do with the railway, with the CN. As you can see, the CN symbol there on our one lamp. Uh, here on our other one. Uh, these these uh, lamps here would uh, sit outside uh, the cars uh, to light the, the doorways and the caboose and so forth. Uh, then we come this way. We have a mangle, otherwise known as a clothes press. What you do is you'd uh, get the pressure and the tension down here. You'd run it, your linens through and so forth and would press them out, coming nice uh, press, nicely pressed. Lots of stories, uh, incidentally, of little brothers, you know, and sisters daring each other and getting their fingers and their hands stuck. And then here we have a, a homemade ironing board. Uh, to go with it, uh, we have our sawed or sad irons uh, here, our collection. A lot of these, uh, you see the most common ones are these ones here. You have parents or grandparents that have these. Then you have the different variations. Uh, like this one here, what you do is you'd open this up, you'd stick this in your fire or your stove, you pop it back in, and then you just iron away. Uh, this one here has been in the Wakefield family since the 1800s. This one ran on your hot coals from your stove. You'd put them inside, you'd shut it, and then you'd actually, what you do is you'd spin it around like this to get the air circulating and warm the coals up, and you'd iron away. This is a smaller version, a lot of the ones that took or ran on hot coals were a lot larger. And uh, as you can see, uh, what they didn't have, they made uh, big chunks of iron here just stuck together, quite heavy. Uh, Builds a lot of muscles back then. Then we have the not so old, but old enough to be in here, the Coleman gas uh, irons here. Uh, not so much problems with the later models like these, but more problems. If you can see up here, uh, to this one here, they had problems with it. Uh, it would leak and so forth, so you, you would get a fire or uh, even an explosion that happens sometimes. Then we come uh, this way. We have our uh, washboards or scrub boards. Uh, again, what you didn't have, you made. We have a yoke. Uh, this one's hand carved. Uh, this one more in just uh, industrialized, I guess you would say, with the uh, springs. Our washing machine collection here is in chronological order from our oldest all the way up to our electric Maytag one over here. And we come over here, we have some uh, homemade soap. Uh, the ingredients listed here. Uh, this soap is, uh, well, the ingredients is, is quite uh, different from the uh, majority of ingredients that put in soap that you've seen. Uh, here they used uh, unsalted fat and uh, other, other uh, ingredients. Uh, didn't use lye, incidentally, in which a lot of soap back then was just uh, unsalted fat and lye. So uh, kind of neat. Uh, come through here, we have pictures of the area. We have a picture of the first piano coming in the uh, White Court area. In 1909, they had to float it down the river. Uh, and this is more pictures of the area. Uh, then we have our axe collection. Uh, we have some Hudson's, uh, Hudson Bay hatchet heads uh, here and one over there. Uh, the broad axe, uh, the uh, timber hook and so forth. And we look up here, we have some snowshoes uh, made by uh, Indians uh, in the area. Uh, different sizes for, you know, uh, your adults and your children and, and so forth. 
Uh, we come uh, over here. We have a potato planter. Uh, what you do is you you stick it in the ground. It would open up, and you drop your old potato in here. Open it up, and then cover the uh, ground in. Uh, save your back. Uh, quite an ingenious device. Uh, I really don't why. Really don't know why you don't see more of these today. And then uh, here we have uh, a crank wheel here. You used to uh, you push it with your foot. It was used in the first dental office in the Laxinan area. Uh, I could see how people would be uh, afraid of the dentist to see things like that. But through a series of pulleys and so forth, you would use uh, this to power your drills and so forth. And then we have some ice skates uh, behind behind this here. Uh, some not so old ones uh, and some older ones here where you had to clip on to your shoes. And here we have some foot warmers, otherwise known as sleigh warmers. What you do is you'd <coughs> open this up. There would be a hot coal or hot coals from your uh, stove or you'd have a stone like this one in there. You'd heat them up, you'd stick them in. The heat would radiate out and it would keep your phone feet nice and uh, toasty in, the, in a sleigh ride or some people just kept them in their houses to uh, keep their feet warm. Uh, then we have a saw down here from uh, 1893. Uh, very, very good condition uh, as are most of our saws. If we look up at the crosscut saw and the buck saw, we see that their, uh, their teeth and even on this uh, hand saw here are uh, in, in great condition. A lot of saws you see have their teeth worn down a lot more. Uh, same as this one being over 100 years old, it, uh, it is in great condition. Then we come this way. We have our tool set. Uh, all of them uh, donated by Mr. Uh, Accord. He had, uh, he had a couple of these sets and uh, we were lucky enough to, to get one of them. Very grateful kind of neat to see the evolution of the tool. Uh, you can't really change much about tools too much, but uh, even so, uh, different to see. Okay, uh, again with the tools, we have a, an alligator wrench here. What you do is you stick on your uh, nut or bolt and you just turn it and it would tighten it up and then you could just remove the bolt or, or uh, tighten it up uh, considering which way you did it. Then we see some uh, old tools here, but uh, still you still see them used nowadays. Uh, an old draw knife to peel logs or timber and so forth. Uh, then we come here, we have a, an old drill bit. Uh, dated back over 100 years old. You still see these in use with hobbyists making models and so forth. Okay, here we have uh, a metal uh, plane. Uh, then we have uh, some wooden planers uh, down here. Uh, different sizes and styles and so forth. We come down here, uh, we have uh, some tobacco cutters, primarily used or sold as uh, tobacco cutters, but again, uh, what you didn't have, you did with back then, so I'm sure they uh, used them to cut many things. Then down here we have uh, an early hot plate or a stove. What you do is you'd fill this up with your kerosene, you'd put her in, and then it would run through, and you could light it, and you could regulate your flame through here. Uh, very primitive from, uh, from the ones you see nowadays. Uh, I've actually seen uh, many of these, not with just one, but more than one of these uh, kerosene uh, bottles on top to hold the kerosene, but two or three, and they would intersect into the one and come up. And we come this way, we have uh, an old uh, bicycle uh, horn. Uh, sounds more like a duck call to me, but here I'll. Then we have some uh, bicycle lanterns uh, from America in 1913. Uh, very good detail. Uh, have little shiny stones in there. Very neat. Kerosene themselves. Then we have. Uh, Moose antlers here, uh, quite an impressive rack 
they, I'm not sure the span on them. They say here it's the second largest in Alberta, but I'm pretty sure that they're not the second largest anymore, even though they are quite impressive. We come down here, we have an old miner's candle holder. Uh, holder. We have uh, a series of hooks, picks and so forth. What they do is they'd be down there with the rock and they try to pound it in or hook it any way they could to sustain it so they could have some candlelight. And we come this way, we have a, a coal miner's cap, quite small, uh, made out of uh, just hard leather, uh, again with the kerosene lantern. Uh, kind of interesting because uh, in the Laxinan area, we don't really have a history of uh, coal mines and so forth. And we come this way, we have uh, some 1913 Ford headlights or headlamps. And some mud guards here uh, used to protect your headlamps or uh, headlights. Uh, probably not these mud guards here weren't used for these Fords, 1913 lights. We come over here, we have a uh, model of a steam engine uh, donated and made by uh, Mr. Richmond. Um, he was, uh, he made this uh, when he was uh, living in England. Uh, very neat. Uh, one of the things they won't let me try out, <laughs> but as you can see we have the governor here and everything. Uh, says it still works. Uh, we come down here, we have a, a sausage press and a, a meat grinder. Uh, quite large, probably used in a butcher's shop. And uh, if we look up here, we have uh, a hand carved oak, uh, yoke, sorry. Uh, then we have some uh, oxen collars, uh, served as the same purpose as the yoke. Uh, then we have an old phone, as you can see, an old telephone book from January 1931, uh, Edmonton and District. A lot of people look through here and they find uh, sometimes their phone number or uh, relatives like that. But you have things uh, from Beaver Lodge to uh, Daggerville and so forth. Uh, then uh, over here we have a copper coil. It was uh, an apparatus used in a uh, still for making uh, moonshine, uh, bootleg alcohol, during Prohibition during the 20s when they had it in Canada. Uh, probably seen more use in the 30s when uh, Prohibition was uh, ended in Canada but started in America when you had the Canadian rum runners running down to try to make an extra buck. And then here we have a, a honey decomber. What you do is you'd stick your honeycomb in here you twirl it around, and it would splatter against the sides. It would run down, and then you could drain it through the bottom here. Uh, many variations on these things. Some people's were bigger, or some were bigger. Uh, some also ran on uh, foot, foot pedals. Then we look up here, we have a Coleman's hot plate or a gas stove. come down this way. We have a, it seems to be uh, some sort of a, uh, by uh, some have to do with accounting to uh, record your, your books, uh, almost like a photocopier in a sense. Uh, it's missing a, a lot of pieces out of the back or the front here. But what you do is you load the, uh, the film through here. Oh Lord, it would take a regular camera, well not regular camera film, but camera type film. Uh, then you'd uh, stick it in here, you'd run it through, and it would take pictures of your, uh, your documents. And then, uh, I'm not too sure if it would actually develop them itself, but uh, it would uh, help aid in the uh, accounting process. And we come this way, we have uh, an old lock-up door. Uh, 
from the laxing and detachment uh, when there was the Northwestern Mounted Police before there was the Rural Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, a lot different from uh, today's jails, or so I hear. Uh, big old uh, switch lock. Uh, we come down here, a drum set uh, donated. Uh, about 1920s, uh, later, later 20s, probably 28. Uh, but it's uh, seen its fair share. And we come uh, over here, we have uh, a Royal Canadian Mounted uh, Police uh, uniform. Uh, our mannequins, uh, he served his time. But uh, we, uh, we had the opportunity to purchase this from the Canadian government. It wasn't actually uh, once an old Mounties. Uh, we had the uh, opportunity to purchase it. Uh, when the museum was in San Guido, so they snapped at the chance to do so. Over here, I was saying before, in 1862, the Hudson's Bay Company came to the Laxinan area. We have a picture of the, uh, the first family who ran the store, uh, the Guns. And then Mr. Peter Gunn, uh, of whom the town of Gunn was named after, right there. Then we have uh, pictures of the area. We have a picture of, picture of Green Court there. Uh, that's the open, uh, they just uh, added a pool hall in. Uh, kind of interesting to see uh, how Green Court was just, you know, originally two buildings. Again, we have more pictures that have to do with the, the Laxinan area. Picture of the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, picture of the Laxinan Hotel. Then we come this way, uh, over here. We have a, uh, found it in the back cleaning. It seems to be a, an old ledger for uh, the province of Alberta, the government of Alberta, almost as if it was a tax booklet from 1913, 1914. Because back then, uh, if you didn't want to uh, pay for your taxes, or if you couldn't, they'd let you work it off uh, by clearing the road. Uh, you could also uh, lend out equipment, horses, and plows, and so forth. But the uh, the penmanship and the ledgers is is just un unremarkable among today's standards. Although back then it was uh, very uh, very important, and even in school, writing was more emphasized than it is today. We have an old uh, Cambridge lamp for mining. You'd send it down and uh, you'd keep it there, not really for the purpose of, uh, of uh, emitting light, but more or less for protection. If the flame went, went out, then you knew that uh, it was too dangerous to be down there. Lack of air or uh, different, maybe even poisonous gases be down there, been down there. Some platters. This one came into uh, Canada before 1812, not incidentally into the Laxinan area, but uh, for being for being its age, it's in uh, very good condition, just with the, the chip there and a crack. And then here we have uh, another platter. Looks looks really insignificant uh, to the eye. Seems to be uh, just a a platter you'd get uh, fries on at a restaurant, but the significance is in the back here it says Edmonton Northwest Territories before the formation of Alberta. And this here is our one of our most valuable uh, pieces at the museum. Uh, it's an old carnival or uh, depression glass as it, as it was otherwise referred to uh, set, punch bowl set. Uh, very rare. Uh, everything's in, in great condition, but the, the reason why they're, they're popular among collectors is because in the process of making uh, the carnival or depression glass, they had to use, uh, I think it was either lead or, or mercury, one of the two, uh, to make it, and uh, therefore uh, they were very poisonous, so you, you're not allowed to make them anymore. And we come here, we have a, an old commode, 
kind of interesting story how I had to learn what it was, but uh, uh, it's a potty, uh, I guess you say, uh, probably used in uh, urban, uh, probably a city uh, of some sort, uh, probably a wealthier person to have uh, something like this, but you'd have uh, a pot down there and you'd have a place in here, I guess, for your, uh, your reading, I guess, uh, and you have your your wash, wash pan there. Uh, we come this way. We have uh, women's fashions for the time. If we look over there, we have two mannequins uh, dressed up. And then we look over here. We have an old uh, bedspread, uh, waste not what not, made out of uh, tobacco sacks. Old chum, uh, what you didn't have, you made. As you can see, there's 120 of them sewn together to make to make the bedspread. And then uh, again with the ladies' fashions, we have a authentic alligator handbag, uh, teeth and all. Uh, probably not too fashionable by today's standards, but uh, nevertheless, neat to see how uh, how fashion and so forth have changed through the years. When we come uh, back over here again, we have a, an old gramophone. Uh, our table model and uh, our bigger one here aren't the old, old type because they have the speakers coming from the bottom uh, as shown. Uh, the older type of gramophones had the big horns coming up uh, from back here. Uh, but here I can crank it up and see if you can have a listen. Uh, a lot different from today's standards. <laughs> we uh, we lucked out, uh, uh, being we we found uh, and we got donated along with the uh, the gramophone uh, some pins or needles I should say for the uh, for the uh, gramophone. Quite a lot. Uh, these ones came from Germany. Uh, these ones over here, uh, just a local kind you could buy back then. Let's go and open it. But uh, we usually don't play it a lot because it, it uh, somewhat damages it a little. But again, uh, we lucked out as another time, as with having a, quite a, a good record collection of old 78s. And uh, before you had the gramophones, you had uh, the old cylinder players. We come this way. Uh, this one isn't a very old model, again with the speaker being at the bottom. But as you can see here, we have quite a, quite a selection of gramophone or cylinders. You'd buy them and, and they'd look uh, just like this with the top on. You'd Take it off and you just pull out your cylinder. I'll uh, see if we can get it started up for you. It uh, doesn't really uh, run the greatest anymore because of the dust of, has collected and, uh, and so forth through the years, so it sometimes skips, but here we'll try.
as you can tell the sound, it, uh, it needs to be cleaned. <laughs> uh, we come this way, uh, we have uh, some glassware. Uh, here we have a, a set here. Um, very nice. We used to have the bottom uh, of the sugar bowl, but uh, it got misplaced, uh, we're pretty sure, because uh, we figured if it was stolen, uh, it probably would have uh, took the top. But uh, then again, you never know. And have uh, some glasses and so forth up here, and an old vase. We look over here. We have we have a uh, an old love seat uh, from 1867, the same year Canada became a country. Uh, still the original upholstery. Uh, again, uh, neat to see the uh, how style has changed through the years. Uh, we come back over here. We have uh, a viewmaster. Uh, what you do is you'd open it up. You'd look through there and you'd adjust it, kind of like 3D. Uh, again, the kind of uh, neat the photographs, uh, are very nice. But they're actually worth more than the the actual viewmaster itself. So sometimes you have to watch out for uh, people uh, trying to grab one for souvenir. We have an old organ here. Uh, we 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 seldom do we uh, play it, if all, because uh, it is old and it, it's it's quite hard on on the old organ from 1870. But what you do is you. You pump these up until the pressure builds, and then pull here, and then just play it like uh, you would a piano, almost. Again, uh, more uh, more lanterns. Uh, very nice uh, craftsmanship, the way they were made. If we come back over here, we have uh, kind of the. Uh, Ironic thing, we have an old uh, family album uh, donated by Mr. John Liss. But uh, the ironic thing is we, we don't know who the family is in here. We have uh, some pictures and, and some postcards, but nothing written. Uh, as you can see, the, the photographs are uh, very nice. Uh, probably a wealthier family. And there we have uh, the postcard of Queen Victoria the First. As again, uh, with, with the styles, you can see the men in the, the big fur coats, ladies wearing uh, corsets and so forth. We come back over here, we have uh, some uh, literature from the uh, era, lots of just handy books to have around, a painkiller almanac. Uh, stretching your dollar, uh, probably still used, could be used today. Uh, more recipes. Uh, here we have uh, uh, more pictures. Uh, these ones actually made out of tin, uh, called tin types, uh, from 1890. Very nice condition.
Then we have an old uh, clock. Uh, it says here it was purchased in about 1912, but you can see uh, this style of clock was uh, very popular in the uh, early 1900s, uh, late 1800s. Uh, you can see them in the Sears catalog. Here we can get it to, uh, to chime. Thank you.